amazing thing for me also during this Happy Days time, I just thought, Betty Davis called me up, took me out to dinner with my wife. Uh, sat at a table at the first People's Choice Awards, sitting right next to James Stewart, sitting across from Robert Mitchum. They knew who I was. Uh, Barbara Stanwyck knew who I was. Um, and all of the, the, the people that I got to, uh, to meet later on, um, because I had played the Fonz, um, Adam Sandler called me up, put me in his Hanukkah song. I called him up. I said, I'm so proud to be in your Hanukkah song. He called me up, said, you want to be in the water boy? I called him up. I said, absolutely. You know, it just, the, um, the uh, legacy, you know, the ripples in the water, just fantastic. All these great, the, the travels, the, uh, it, it just, the, the life, because it was so rich. Um, so thick because I played this character. And your parents, what, what, how did they respond to this? I was invited to the Carter White House. I couldn't go because we were shooting the show. My father said, wait a minute, the president of the United States calls you, go. I said, no, you don't understand. It costs about a million dollars. You can't just shut down the show and go to the White House. I have to go another time. If he wants me to come, he'll invite me another time. Otherwise, I have the invitation. It's very nice. Are you kidding me? You go to the White House and don't forget to bring cake. Okay. Thanks, Dad. You know, they would, uh, my mother would walk up and down the aisle of a uh, plane. Yeah, so you know my son's a Fonz? I'm the mother. Oh, you know, it's very nice. Fonzie is my son. Yeah, it's fine. I met people all over the world who said, oh, I have your parents' autograph. My parents actually became lobbyists. Uh, they would sit in the lobby of hotels in Florida and go, yeah, so Fonz is my son. Oh, it was very nice to see you, yeah. Oh. yeah. That's how it happened. Okay, just a couple more questions on Happy Days. I wanted to bring up my favorite work in the, that episode. Okay. Gary Marshall's son, Scott, was a young boy, thought that it would be fun to have an alien on Happy Days. They went about casting or Mork for Mork and um, couldn't hire anybody. Nobody wanted to do this character. It was too strange. They found this brand new stand-up comedian. Now, you have to understand, usually a guest star would be at the table on Monday when we read the script for the first time and rehearse with us because you only have four and a half days. It's now Wednesday. We don't have anybody. All of a sudden, Robin Williams shows up on the set. Within five, six minutes, you knew you were in the presence of greatness. And I knew that my job now was to keep a straight face because you know who he is. You know. Now, imagine him raw. Whatever anybody said went in and came out with lightning speed. I said to him, hey, you want to rumble? He went, da 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 want to rumble? I mean, he was singing West Side Story. He was all over the place. He was like, I don't know, like this firefly, like this sprite. Fantastic. And then the rest was history. Do you have a favorite episode of the show? I think one of my favorite episodes is when I had to pray to God for Richie to get better because he was in a car accident. And one of the realest, realest moments on the show is when I think 250, 251, somewhere in there, it's uh, Richie says goodbye um, forever. It was a two-parter. And when I said goodbye to Richie, he had come back now after years of not being on the show, and he was directing. And when I said goodbye to Richie, I said goodbye to Ron, and that emotion was deep. How did the character change from that first day to the end of the series? 
Oh, I think he straightened out too much toward the end. You know, he became a teacher and he kind of settled down. I wore, uh, I changed my T-shirt from white to black, back again. But I think basically he stayed the same. Where do you think he'd be today? He would be Mr. Goodwrench. He would own a, uh, you know, a chain. Okay, I'd like to talk about some of the other roles that you, you did during, during your Happy Days work. Yeah. Um, you did some incredible feature films mm -hmm. during that time. Uh, Night movie. Shift? Uh, Heroes and the one Heroes? Uh, I, a hero, Ned Tannen, was the president of uh, Universal Pictures at the time. And I went in uh, with uh, Jeremy Kagan and sold Heroes. Um, I uh, then, uh, we, um, I auditioned Meryl Streep. We auditioned a lot of ladies in New York, and Meryl Streep was one of them. And you talk about being thunderstruck by a human being, you know, just like, wow. But she didn't have a name, and she had no credits, and so Universal would not allow her to be in the movie. So we hired a young actress who was on television. Uh, she was the flying nun, but she stopped acting, went to school, started to study, came back out again out of her cocoon, and went on to win multiple Academy Awards, uh, Sally Field in Heroes. And then uh, there was a guy, uh, Harrison Ford, who had just done a movie against blue screen. You know, uh, he didn't know what he had done. Uh, and it was called Star Wars. And uh, so he was um, uh, co-star. Then we did The One and Only, directed by Carl Reiner. And uh, then Ron asked me to uh, be in his first um, film for a major studio, for Warner Brothers, for the uh, Alan Ladd Company. Um, and he said, you could play the part. And I thought, well, I've just played the Fonz for, uh, you know, 10 years. So I'm, maybe I'll play Ron now. I'll play Richie. So I took uh, Chuck in uh, Night Shift. Last night I was having a piece of pizza at Mulberry Pizza uh, in Beverly Hills, and the guy next to me said, oh, I've got to tell you, one of my top five films is Night Shift. How was it working with Ron Howard as a director? Ron Howard was very nervous, you know, because he was young. He didn't know if the crew and the cast and that size in a major motion picture would listen to him, would have respect for him. There was a commercial at the time for E.F. Hutton, and they would say, uh, which was a stockbroker um, firm. And uh, the, the thing went, uh, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. And then all the extras in the, uh, in the uh, commercial would wait to hear E.F. Hutton. You would ask Ron Howard a question on the set. He'd say, let me think about that. The entire crew, the entire cast, waited to hear what Ron had to say because within an in, in instant, he had full command, full respect of the entire operation. written by Lowell Gans and Babalu Mandel, who had written Happy Days for seven years. He met uh, uh, Brian Grazer at that time. They started to partner up. I shot a home movie of the making of Night Shift, and I have Ron Howard directing me through my 8 millimeter camera I said, so, what do you think? He said, well, that was nice. If you do it like this, I'd probably print it, but, you know, very low key. I go, okay, Ron, I'll do it like this. I'll do it the way you want it. It's fine. He was fantastic. You talked about break, trying to turn your break, out, break out of that Bonds character. Did you feel typecast? I feel typecast to this day. I am typecast.
uh, to this day. I, it is hard for me because people still see me as the Fonz. But then that becomes your job. Then you have to figure out how to get around that. And um, either you can be typecast and you can break your spirit, or you can be typecast and say, you know what, where there's a will, there's a way. If you will it, it is not a dream. And so you just negotiate through. I stopped acting for a while. Uh, my lawyer, Skip Brittenham, uh, said, oh, I think maybe we'll start a company for you. I said, I can't do that. I'm dyslexic. I, I can't. Uh, I don't know anything about business. He said, no, it's okay. You'll learn. And then out of that company with um, these partners that uh, I met along the way, um, uh, John Rich and, uh, and Daniel, and um, we did uh, MacGyver. Was this Fair, Fair Dinkum? Fair Dinkum, yeah. And then offshoots of Fair Dinkum, you know, it was uh, Winkler that, Daniels. Yeah, how did that get named? Uh, I, I went down in 1979, I went down to Australia to do the Logie Awards, which were their Emmys, to be a presenter. They, it was, uh, Happy Days was very big down there. And I went to the Outback, uh, uh, to Alice Springs, uh, a town all the way in the bowels of Australia, uh, where the, you know the uh, uh, Aboriginals are uh, farm workers and uh, uh, cattle ranchers, and and I heard the word fair dinkum, which means the um, honest man or genuine article, and it just struck me, and I named my company uh, Fair Dinkum. What were among its first projects? We did uh, after-school specials. I directed uh, or produced after-school specials. We did three or four of them. Uh, we did MacGyver. We did um, uh, uh, sightings uh, with Ann Daniel uh, and uh, Steve Krupnik. Um, we did uh, So Weird. Um, we did... You know, um, just a, a lot of stuff. Well, talk a little bit about MacGyver. How, how hands-on were you on that project? Oh, we were really hands-on, John Rich and I. But Tony Jonas, uh, who then went on to, uh, to become a, a producer, was the president of our company at that time. And he brought us the notion of a can-do guy who was also a shortcut guy. When you couldn't go to the authorities anymore, you called on MacGyver. And then we sold the concept to, um, uh, to um, Ann Daniel at uh, ABC. And we then, uh, it went through a metamorphosis. He was going to work for the um, Smithsonian. He then uh, was going to do this, he was going to do that, and finally we got him at the Phoenix Foundation, and uh, he was this operative who used everything around his world uh, and in his world to make um, things happen. And he became uh, a, a, literally, he got into the lexicon, you know, hey, you just MacGyvered that. Um, the uh, Swiss Army knife became one of the most popular birthday gifts. Uh, kids started science clubs all over the country, um, you know. And finding those MacGyver-isms, the show eventually was just run by uh, Steve Downing and uh, Michael Greenberg. And Steve Downing was the um, uh, assistant, um, assistant chief of police in L.A. Uh, and was this amazing man who kept the show on the air for seven years. He was just an amazing guy. But John Rich and I, we cast the show, we, we read every script, we worked with the writers, we uh, worked with the, uh, the network, um, we were on the set, we were in the office. It, it was um, completely hands-on. Now, now um, did you cast Richard Dean Anderson? Was that, yes. How did he... We met a lot of very handsome men. And then he came in and he couldn't find his glasses and he couldn't read a script, and that just the, the foible, just the, the, the flaw of this handsome guy needing his, you know, being blind, uh, just, he just was it. He just owned it. Do you know what I mean? He just knew, boom, this is it. And he turned out to be the quintessential uh, star of uh, television.
He then went on to do Stargate. He's been on television longer than I've been alive. You know, just amazing. What do you think is your producing style? I learned my style from Tom Miller, Eddie Milkus, and uh, Gary Marshall. That um, I love what you do. I, uh, I appreciate you. Uh, I am uh, proud of you as a group. Uh, we are going to make this show. We're going to make it together. Uh, and don't you dare say, I'm not coming out of my trailer. Did anyone ever say that to you? Yes. And then we had a little talk. And then uh, they came out. The bad behavior is, unfortunately, so, uh, uh, rewarded in television because you need the person it's so fast uh they are the star or whatever it is you know they've got the name they're the draw and um you know it, there was a moment when gary marshall was uh, back on happy days was introducing the guest cast at the end of the show i went up to gary marshall and i whispered in his ear when he was introducing the guest cast that you know what we i had to do my um uh, my pickups I had to do my retakes uh, pretty quickly because I had to catch a plane to make a personal appearance in Arkansas. Gary Marshall put down the microphone, came over to me, took me by the shirt, put me up against the wall and said, don't you ever do that again. I am introducing the guest cast. They have every right to be introduced with respect as you do. I went, you're absolutely correct. I'm shutting up. I'm sitting down and I never did it again. I learned. I learned. You don't punch out your script. You, I, you learned the etiquette, the respect, the, the, um, the camaraderie, the full circle-ness of what it takes to be an actor. I'll ask you about a few other projects. Tim Conway's Funny America. Ah! And Daniel. And uh, um, uh, um, who brought it to me? Burn Bound. Stuart Birnbaum. Uh, and we took Tim Conway. Now, let me just say, Tim Conway is joyful. This is a man who, off the top of his head, will make you wet your pants. And uh, we took him all over the country. We sold this to ABC as a summer series. We, uh, and Eric Schatz was our, um, who now runs... Uh, a big production company uh, in town and, and has lots of shows on every cable channel. Uh, we traveled in a, um, in a Lincoln across the country and we would put Tim on the street in, with uh, hidden cameras. You know, uh, he was a, um, a gas uh, reader uh, in uh, Minnesota. And he would carry a chain that he would drag along the street. This was right after a major thunderstorm in this particular city. And he would literally get people to drag the chain so that they would ground themselves against the electricity that was in the pavement from the electrical storm yesterday. And so you'd have people drag. And it would be like that. He would just involve citizens across the country. Unfortunately, it didn't go, but it was funny to make. Now, you created, produced, and directed it. I directed it. We co-created it. I mean, um, Roger and, uh, uh, and Anne, and, uh, my, who was my partner at the time, and uh, Eric, we, uh, Stuart, we all did it together. Tim, we all did it together. Talk about the directing process for you. How, 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 what's your process of the Well, we had, um, multi multi we had multiple cameras. We were sitting in a truck. We watched them. I would talk into the uh, camera's ears. I would say, go get the, uh, look at the person. The person's hand is shaking. Look at the person. The person is, uh, get the eyes, you know, uh, like that. And then, oh, then we would do in front of an audience, and I would talk to the audience and get them riled up, and then... Uh, we would do Tim and shoot the audience and look for faces in the audience, and then we had all that for the editing process. And, and normal. Okay. 
fun. Do you have a particular directing style, particularly uh, coming from an acting background? My directing style is that, um, uh, again, ensemble. Do you know? The buck stops here, but uh, who has the best idea wins. I directed Dolly Parton's first TV movie. And uh, my daughter was in preschool, and I, w I took her to school, and um, an executive from NBC came up to me, dropping off his daughter, and said, oh, good morning, Mr. 37 Chair. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, your movie last night uh, took the night. Okay, that's how I learned. But anyway, uh, so that's what it is to live in Hollywood. But anyway, um, I was directing Dolly, and uh, a policeman came in and wanted to take a souvenir from the apartment that she was kidnapped or we thought that she was kidnapped from. And I thought, well, I can't do that because that's tantamount to stealing. So I said, ladies and gentlemen of the crew, this is my problem. The policeman wants to take a souvenir. Uh, uh, they can't take anything uh, because it's tantamount to stealing. The boom man said, hey, she was writing in the scene before uh, Dolly Parton was writing songs. She didn't like it. She tore it up and she threw it in the waste paper basket. Take one of her songs that she discarded. I said, that's what we're going to do. I thank you very much. That man held that boom for the rest of the show like nobody's business because he was now invested and part of the process. You don't know where the great idea is going to come from. That's how I direct. Uh, Monty. Monty. Monty, I learned a very big lesson. Monty, I learned two big lessons. Mark Lawrence, who wrote with Gary Goldberg on um, uh, Family Ties, sent me a script. I read it. I laughed out loud. It was too controversial. I said, I, you know what? I want to do another series. This is too controversial. He came to me again. He presented it, I read it, rewritten, funnier. I said, it's too controversial. It's just too controversial. We'll never get it on. He came to me a third time, and the third time I couldn't say no. I played Rush Limbaugh with a gay daughter. Kate Burton was my wife. It was funny. John... Um, well, we'll cut that out. It was funny. NBC saw it, called me up. We were picked up, gave me a ticket to get on the plane for the upfronts. The upfronts are where all of the networks uh, in May um, present their new fall schedule. I'm going to New York. We're going to New York. We're doing Monty. Funny, funny show. John Pasquin, uh, who directed Broadway uh, and uh, was the director of the show. NBC called me the next day and said, could I have that ticket back? Somehow they must have sent it to GE or I don't know where, but 1994 was just too early for a gay daughter on the air, and they, I was now off the schedule. This made me nuts. We made it over at Disney. Jeff Katzenberg said, we're going to sell this. We went to Fox. We sold it. Now they say, well, you know what, the gay daughter, maybe we won't do the gay daughter, and uh, we'll do uh, David, uh, David Schwimmer will be your oldest son. David Krumholtz. Uh, who's on numbers now, will be your youngest son. Uh, and your oldest son will have a problem. He wanted to be a lawyer. You were really proud of him. He now wants to be a chef. John Pasquin said, this is not the show I signed on for. He left. James Burroughs came on board. We made the show. We did six episodes. It was canceled. My two lessons. One is... When your instinct tells you you shouldn't be doing something, don't do it. 
when you know in your heart that this is probably going to be more problem problematic than anything else, don't do it. Listen to your inner voice. Very big lesson. Major lesson. Second lesson. When the writer has an instinct and a, um, a germ that is, that is um, his engine, that is fueling his enthusiasm, that is writing his humor, that he understands. Do not think you can bastardize it and then have the same success. You cannot change it and water it and mamby-pamby it down and have the same enthusiasm, the same vision, the same intensity. Walk away. John Pascoe walked away. Walk away. Don't be the good soldier and think, I'm going to beat it. I'm going to sell it. We're going to sell it. Walk away. Have you done it with many projects since then? Hello. I will listen in the room and I will stop somebody from pitching and say, I'm so sorry. I am not, I am not in any way judging your piece. I'm only telling you I'm not the guy. I don't get it. The penny is not dropping. It is a waste of, my, uh, of, of your time for me to sit here and then say I'm going to think about it and come back to you and say no. I, I've reduced it down to that. I nip it in the bud. Really. And, and people love being told the truth. Take the Band-Aid off very quickly. You know, it's much better than pulling each hair one by one. You know? One Christmas. One Christmas. The last movie with Katherine Hepburn that she ever made. I acted with Katherine Hepburn, saying a line to her. Yes, ma'am, what do you think? Holding up a cue card, having her read the line. No, I feel the same way. Holding up the cue card, putting it down. And pretty much, you know, that is the way that we did it. It was magnificent to be in her presence. I also acted with Swoozy Kurtz. That was like a dessert you don't want to end. Uh, you directed for Dave's World. Dave's World. I had a wonderful time doing Dave's World. My, uh, I, it was the first time I met Jamie Widows, I think, who then directed me many times uh, after that. But um, what I did was, what I was able to do was, they were, there were two, the two sons, and they had a major scene together in the show. And I took them and I did theater games with them. I put them back to back and I made them do the scene without looking at each other. And eventually they did this scene and the producers came and said, uh, we have never gotten a performance like this from these kids again. Uh, I worked with uh, Patrick Warburton, I think was his first, uh, his first show, uh, who is unbelievably funny. I don't think I got along with Harry Anderson very well. What stopped the change of tape? 